Okay. So this is the last of the two joint classes. Am I in range somewhat? Okay. And then my kids have provided two illustrations. You can try to figure out which one was done by my son, Cameron, age seven, and which one was done by my daughter, Kayla, age five. If you can't figure out from the hint, uh, also see me after class. All right. So the purpose of this is to have two unified lectures about applications of probability in mathematical modeling. We did the discrete case last time. Now we're going to do the continuous case. There's a lot of interplay between the two different systems. And so a lot of times, techniques that we use in one can be used in the other with just very minor tweaks. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about a particular example, the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, any history buffs here? OK, so I can basically say whatever I want. Excellent. All right. Whoops. And so basically, you know, I want to understand continuous models. I want to solve continuous deterministic systems. And so the key word is deterministic. All right. In general, deterministic does not necessarily mean easy, but there's at least a procedure that we can go through and get to the answer. In real world situations, things are not going to be completely deterministic. You do not know exactly what is going to happen. And small little changes can lead to wildly different behavior. This is where probability comes into play, where you have a bunch of different outcomes, a bunch of different strategies. These are played with various probabilities. And depending on what happens, you have a whole chain of events. So again, we are doing the simple case now where everything is completely deterministic. I'll talk a little bit about some of the complications that happens when you put in probability. All right, and that's basically the stochastic processes. We'll discuss the general solutions. We didn't get to Zeckendorf decompositions in too much detail in last class. So I want to go back and revisit them. It's a great way to meet a lot of the probability distributions, see some of the applications of Fibonacci numbers, look at the most worthless application in the history, I think, of mathematics to a theoretical result. But it is at least amusing for little kids, so I will talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about coding, how you would do some of this stuff, how you would write the code quickly if there is time. If not, there are snapshots of the code here. I don't know why, if anybody wants extra credit, the verbatim tech package is not interfacing nicely with the Beamer package. And so I have to keep doing these screenshots of tech code. So if anybody can help me figure out why this is not working and save me going through all these tech manuals, I will appreciate it. All right, continuous systems. So there are a lot of different differential equations you can study. Perhaps one of the simplest is let's take f prime of x is a times f of x with some initial condition f naught equals c. If you had to choose a value for a other than the smart ass value of 0, what would you choose? 1. So if you have f prime of x equals f of x, you're looking for a function which is its own derivative. And the solution is e to the x. Any other solutions? 0 is still of the form e to the x. It's 0 times e to the x. So what would the general solution be? So it's not just e to the x. Does anything else work in addition to e to the x? A times e to the x. When you have a differential equation, a first order differential equation with one prime, you have one free constant. If you have two primes, two derivatives, how many constants do you think you have? Two. This is very similar to what we had with Fibonacci numbers. We had a recurrence relation of depth two. We needed to specify two conditions, two initial conditions, to uniquely determine what was going on. Here we have one condition. And in fact, if we look at f of 0 equals c, that specifies the unique condition I need. And we get the solution when a equals 1 is f of x equals c times e to the x. Well, the more general case isn't that much harder. The general solution is just c times e to the ax. And we'll see that when we take the derivative, the a just comes down. So if f of x is c times e to the ax, then f prime is a c e to the ax. Is it that way, or is it c times a e to the ax? Or does it not matter? It doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Multiplication is commutative. OK? So it doesn't really matter what order I write the algebra. That will change later. All right. What about f double prime is af prime plus bf of x? So now this is a second order differential equation. You would expect to need two initial conditions to uniquely determine what's going on. Any thoughts as to how we would solve this or what this kind of looks like? Where have we seen something like this before? What is this similar to? It's similar to the Fibonacci's. And so it's similar to our difference equation. So let's try exponentials. 
Why are we trying exponentials? Well, let's look back at what we did with the Fibonacci's. We looked at things of the form r to the n. If I try f of x equals e to the rho x for some free parameter rho, if I do laws of exponents, e to the rho x is e to the rho to the x. It's like the little letter r is now being played by e to the rho, and the discrete <laughs> integer n is now being played by the real variable x. So all of our intuition from studying discrete systems gives us an idea of how to attack something like this. Let's try an exponential solution. This is very similar to what we saw when we looked at discrete difference equations. And when we go through, we get rho squared e to the rho x equals a rho e to the rho x plus b e to the rho x. Well, e to the rho x is never going to be 0. We can divide by that. And we get a characteristic equation, rho squared minus a rho minus b equals 0. It has roots rho 1 and rho 2. If the roots are equal, it turns out you have to do a little bit more work. But as long as the roots are distinct, which happens most of the time, the general solution is some constant times e to the rho 1x plus some constant e to the rho 2x. And the way you would get these constants is I would have to give you some initial conditions about this differential equation. If I gave you a linear differential equation of depth 3 involving f triple prime in terms of f double prime, f prime, and f, you would just have a characteristic equation of degree 3. So really, we can handle these you know, linear differential equations without too much difficulty. All right, so this is a lot of progress so far. Now, in general, however, we're going to have things that are a lot more complicated. Usually, things will depend on more than just one variable. It's very rare in life that everything comes down to just the value of one quantity. For simplicity today, let's assume everything just depends on x. But maybe we have two different things. Maybe we have f and g. If you want, think of f and g as the population of rabbits and wolves. And then we want to figure out, you know, how does the population evolve over time? And so maybe f prime is af of x plus bg of x, g prime is cf of x plus dg of x. And maybe, you know, if f prime is how the rabbits are changing and g prime is how the wolves are changing, do you expect a to be a positive number or a negative number? Do you expect there to be more rabbits or less rabbits coming from the greater quantity of rabbits? Usually more rabbits for reasons that they can reproduce. What's the reason why more rabbits might lead to less rabbits? Yes? More rabbits, but encourage more wolves, which would bring down the rabbit population. Well, that should then give us the, the other term in the wolf, but just what would more rabbits all be doing that would be interfering with each other? Competing. Competing for resources. So it's possible that maybe beyond some certain critical point, the more rabbits you have could actually cause a negative effect. So you know, having these numbers as constants, this might be a very bad idea. Maybe for small values of rabbit populations, it's a positive effect. More rabbits you have, more rabbits are produced. But beyond some critical tipping point, the more rabbits you have, the more competition you have for resources, and it becomes a negative effect. What about the constant B? Do you think that would be positive or negative? Negative. The wolves are not protecting the rabbits from other enemies. The wolves are the enemies. They're eating the rabbits. So you should have some rough feeling when you look at something like this, what the coefficients should look like. All right, so now we have a system of equations, a system of differential equations. And again, unreasonable situation where I'm assuming that these coefficients are constant, but you know, walk before we can run. Any thoughts as to how we might solve this? This is a lot more complicated than what we had a moment ago. Yes? So one thing is to try to put this in a matrix form. So where have you seen something that looks like this before? Going all the way back to high school. Where have you seen something like this in high school? Obviously not with derivatives. This is similar to solving systems of equations. You know, two equations and two unknowns. Before you knew matrices, how did you solve for a system of equations? Add the two, subtract, you know, solve for one in terms of the other. So let's try to do that. In algebra, we solve for one variable in terms of the others. Well, let's solve for one function in terms of the others. Does it really matter if you solve for f in terms of g or g in terms of f? No. Which should we do? f. f. Right? And by that, I'm going to interpret that the way I want. Let's write g in terms of f and make f the fundamental function that we're looking for because we like to use f first. So I'll take the second one, and I'll write g in terms of f prime and f. And now that I can write g in terms of f prime and f, 
I can now substitute that into the second equation, and now I get an equation just involving f and f prime, and f double prime. So I get f double prime of x is mess times f prime plus mess times f of x. We reduced it to a previously solved problem. So if we have a nice system of equations like this, we can play some games and reduce it to what we just did before, and we don't need to use matrices. Now, of course, it's going to be advantageous to use matrices, but it's nice to know that we can attack this using the techniques we've already learned. We can remove one of the functions and solve for them one at a time. This is the special case where we have constant coefficients. All right. Let's look at it in terms of matrix form. So I'm going to let v of x be the vector f of x, g of x. This should look very similar to what we did with the Fibonacci numbers. And now, as was suggested, we have a matrix. The matrix is a, b, c, d, and we have v prime of x is a, v of x. Does v prime of x equal a, v of x? Does that look like anything we've seen before? We've seen something almost identical to this. Where have we seen this? In what, in what case? In e to the ax. The only, with our system, the only difference was instead of using capital V, I used lowercase f. And instead of using capital A for a matrix, I had little a for a number. So formally, why don't we guess the solution is v of x is e to the ax times v of 0, where e to the ax is the matrix exponential. So we talked a little bit about the matrix exponential last time. You know, I warned that the matrix exponential has a lot of very difficult properties. <laughs> We have to be very careful. e to the a times e to the b is not e to the a plus b. Fortunately, when we looked at that baker campbell hausdorff nightmare formula, everything involved the commutator. You know, the commutator of a and b, and the commutator of a with the commutator of a and b, and this nightmare mess propagating. In terms of what's going on here, we only have two matrices really under consideration, the identity matrix and a in its powers. Well, the identity matrix I can view as a to the zeroth power. a commutes with all powers of itself. a commutes with the identity matrix. Everything commutes. And in this case, all the commutators become zero, and everything becomes really nice. It turns out that this formula for the matrix exponential converges for every matrix. And it converges for any real number x. We can differentiate term by term. This is something you need to justify in general. We're not in the math department today, so I don't have to really worry about it. So we can just formally differentiate term by term. What do you get when you differentiate the identity matrix with respect to x? Zero. What do you get when you differentiate a times x with respect to x? x. I'm sorry, a. Sorry. 1 over 2 factorial a squared times x squared. What do you get when you differentiate that with respect to x? a squared uh, divided by 1 factorial, or just a squared. The next term, we will have a 1 th over 3 factorial a cubed x cubed. We get a 3x squared. So we get an a cubed over 2 factorial. So when we differentiate this with respect to x, we basically get a times e to the ax. We just factor out an a. And so basically, the derivative of e to the ax is just a e to the ax, or we can write it the other way around. And this gives you an idea of why the solution is analogous to what we had before. We can differentiate term by term, and formally everything is fine. All right, so let's do an application, the Battle of Trafalgar. So I'm basing this part of the lecture on a beautiful article written by Lancaster. It is available on the additional comments of the Math 341 homepage. If you want a copy of this article, just shoot me an email, and I'll send it along. So this is going to be a simplified introduction to the, th to the mathematical theory of warfare. All right, we will make a couple of unreasonable assumptions, but enough to give us a rough sense of what's going on, and then we'll test this with one of the most important battles in naval history. All right, so the square law, we're going to have two forces, R of T and B of T, for red and blue. Out of curiosity, how many of you have at least heard of the Battle of Trafalgar? Okay, who was the Battle of Trafalgar between? Who were the combatants? The original combatants. Well, okay, and Admiral Nelson was on which side? The British. And they were fighting the French, no, not just the French, the French and the Spanish. This was before France turned on Spain and Spain joined the British alliance. So, you know, I, for those of you who haven't taken European history, you almost need like a scorecard or a cheat sheet to keep track of who is on which side. At this point in the Napoleonic Wars, Spain is allied with France. 
in the 200th anniversary of the battle, the battle was fought in 1805, in order not to hurt people's feelings, because some countries feel bad that they lose often, they renamed the forces Red and Blue. All right. So we will not talk about who red stands for and who blue stands for. We will just say there are two forces, red and blue, and they're going to have some kind of battle. All right. And B prime, how the blue fleet changes over time, I'm saying is equal to negative N, which is the fighting effectiveness of the red fleet, times R of T. And the rate of change of the red fleet is negative M, the fighting effectiveness of the blue fleet, times B of T. Does this make sense in terms of our model? So what this is saying is, the more red ships we have, the faster the blue fleet is decreasing. Now whether or not it should be R of t, R of t squared, whatever, that's beyond us at this point. But this is the most basic model we can have. The more bad guys or good guys fighting you, depending on your point of view, the faster your forces should be going down. And this is this, the simplest case that the decrease is proportional to the number of ships attacking you. Do we know how to solve a system of equations like this? Yeah, this is exactly what we just did a moment ago. Now this has the unreasonable assumption that your effective fighting is always constant. How many of you have ever watched either the History Channel or its equivalent name, the World War II Channel? Okay. One of the most important battles in World War II was the Bismarck. So the Bismarck was the huge German battleship. It was more powerful than any other battleship that had been assembled and the goal of the Germans was to get this ship out in the Atlantic and prey on the Allied convoys. And this ship had greater firepower, greater range than the other ships. It is a huge advantage when you can shoot at ships and their range is not great enough to shoot back at you. All right? And so the Bismarck, I think, destroyed the hood very easily early in the engagement. In the course of the battle, at one point, one of the British bombers got lucky and on a shot, it hit the propeller of the Bismarck. And it caused major damage and it jammed the propeller and the Bismarck was forced to steam in a circle. And it was stuck steaming in a circle. And at that point, then the British could ass essentially assemble their entire force and attack. This was a huge, huge stroke of good fortune for the British that that torpedo happened to hit in just the right spot. When you are modeling a deterministic thing like that, we are not going to have anything like that. This is a very absurd model for what can go on in war. Small little changes can have a huge outcome. And when you want to look at what is the probability that the British sink the Bismarck, what is the probability that Nelson wins, you need to be able to take into account stuff like this. And in general, you will have a couple of pluses and minuses on both sides. You know, usually not everything goes right for one person and everything goes wrong for the other. But you want a model that will accomplish the objective of taking all this into account. So this is a very simplified beginning, but it's a good start. All right, so we can solve using techniques. What do we expect? Well, B double prime, we just take the derivative of the first, would be negative N times R of T. Well, we can now substitute for R of T. We get a very simple differential equation of degree 2. What's nice is there's no term involving B prime. It's just B double prime is some constant times B of T. And in fact, we get exactly the same equation for the second one. So when we take two derivatives, we get back to where we started, but multiplied by NB. Can anybody tell me what the solution should be? If you want to assume N times M equals 1, we will make the unreasonable assumption that the, oh, I'm sorry, I can't say British, that the red and the blue fleets have the same effective fighting ability. Let's assume n times m equals 1. I want a function whose second derivative equals itself. Yes? E to, e to the x. Anything else? Okay, sine and cosine. Anything else? We have e to the x. We have sine x, cosine x. Yes? Well, zero is a special case. There's one other function. If you're saying e to the x is another function you should be saying. Well, that's still essentially the same as e to the x. I want another function that when I take two derivatives, I get back to where I started. Nope. So if I, I'm sorry, e to the, e to the negative x. Because if I take one derivative, I get negative e to the negative x. If I take two derivatives, I get negative negative e to the negative x. 
Now, if you look at cosine and sine, what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. And then the derivative of negative sine, negative cosine. So sine and cosine actually don't work. The solutions are sine of x, I'm sorry, the solutions are e to the x and negative, and e to the negative x. Or more generally, e to the nmx, e to the negative nmx. So we write a solution like this. So here, this tells me how many blue ships I have at time t, how many red ships I have at time t. And then I need to figure out what these constants beta 1 and beta 2 are. Well, at time t equals 0, it's just how many ships I have initially. One of the things I'm really big on is looking at math and trying to get a sense of what the answer is. Can you give me any information about what should happen as time progresses to b of t or r of t? It should decrease. Is this function growing or decreasing? e to the n square root of nmt, is that growing or decreasing? What about this one? Decreasing. So what do you think is true about beta 1? Well, one thing is it could be less than beta 2, but if beta 1 is even positive, eventually what happens to e to the negative square root nmt? That goes to 0. So if beta 1 is positive, what happens as time goes on? The fleet increases exponentially. So not only is Horatio Nelson tackling the French and the Spanish, but he's actually building new ships in the middle of the battle at an exponentially increasing rate. As good as he is, and he was good, he's not that good. What can you tell me about beta 1? What do you think about beta 1? Well, if it's negative, then at some point you would have a negative British fleet. And in fact, the British fleet would be getting exponentially more negative. So it seems reasonable to believe that beta 1 should be 0, and similarly, alpha 1 should be 0. It turns out that's not the case. And the reason it's not the case goes back to what we were talking about in the very beginning when we were talking about rabbits. The warning with the rabbits was that you want that coefficient a to be positive, that you know, the more rabbits you have, the more rabbits will be produced, except if you wait too long and then the rabbits crowd each other out for resources. When you go back to these equations, b prime is negative n times r of t. So the rate of change of the blue ships is negative n times the number of red ships attacking it. Do you think that formula holds forever? What do you think happens once all the blue ships have been destroyed? Do you now, yes? Yes, and uh, these equations only hold so long as b of t and r of t are positive. Once the blue fleet has been completely destroyed, you do not start getting negative numbers of blue ships. Right? So you've, I'm sorry? So now you've got to be careful because actually back then, unlike modern warfare, you actually had people capturing enemy ships. And so in terms of how many ships you have, you actually can increase the number of ships during a battle by seizing the enemy ships. And that does actually happen in the Battle of Trafalgar. But you're not going to end up having negative ships. So these differential equations, and this is a key fact, when you come up with a mathematical model, your system may only work for certain values. And then beyond that, you may change things. So in terms of when we model these things probabilistically, we might have different random variables, different inputs, depending on where we are. So at some point, we expect this to break down. One of the most interesting applications of this is it's called the law of squares. And so what it's saying is, let's look at how quickly the blue fleet is changing percentage-wise. So we'll look at the change divided by the number of blue ships. And let's say that equals the change in the number of red ships divided by the number of red ships. If those rates are equal, then what's going to happen is the number of red ships and the number of blue ships are going to be perfectly balanced and they will get to zero at the same time, and the two fleets will mutually annihilate each other. And so there's a certain critical value. And so what it basically tells us is that if you go through and you do the algebra, which is coming from this, if you want these two rates to be equal, what should the initial concentrations be? Well, you can just put t equals zero, and n times the number of r ships initially squared equals m times the number of blue ships initially squared. So this is called the law of squares. And so if um, n, which is the effectiveness of the red ships, is four times as great as m, you would need to have twice as many blue ships to balance the fleet 
of the red ships. So this gives you a way to measure essentially how many ships you need. All right, so Nelson was outnumbered. So how could he win? So uh, he, did I skip a page? No. Hmm. Was there? Okay, yeah, so, okay. so over here, um, the battle was the most decisive naval victory of the war. 27 British ships of the line led by Admiral Lord Nelson aboard the HMS Victory. You know, no. Well, I'll let you figure out the name. Defeated 33 French and Spanish ships of the line. So just reading that, who would you give the advantage to? You should give the advantage to the French and Spanish, right? You know, they've got more ships of the line. You know, 33 is greater than 27. All right, so Nelson is outnumbered. How could he win? Well, we just talked a moment ago about effective fighting. Now, again, I'll make the unreasonable assumption that the British effectiveness is the same as the Franco, I'm sorry, the red effectiveness is the same as the blue effectiveness. This is not a reasonable assumption during the Napoleonic Wars. But what this is telling you is that if they are equal, the square of one being equal to the square of the other is what you need for parity. So any thoughts as to how Nelson, when he's outnumbered, could still win? If all the ships attack each other, you know, head on, he's outnumbered. What should he do? I'm sorry? So how, how can Nelson use math to his advantage? His idea is to split the fleet he's fighting and take advantage of mathematics. And so if you go through and do the calculation, originally he thought he was going to have 40 ships of the line against 46 for the enemy. The actual battle numbers were 27 to 33. I'll, I'm just pasting from uh, Lancaster's article. He uses the original numbers, so I'll use the original numbers. Nelson was originally going to have two sets of 16 coming in in a set of eight. Uh, the eight is also known as the sacrificial lambs. Their job is to basically keep 17 ships of the line, I'm sorry, not 17, uh, 23 ships of the line of the Franco-Spanish force, force busy, while Nelson's 32 ships attack 23. So rather than having one massive battle, 40 to 46, he's going to have two battles. The first battle is going to be 32 to 23, and the second is going to be 8 to 23. Which battle do you think Nelson expects to win? The first one. Which one do you think Nelson expects to lose or has less confidence on? The second, right? You know, those poor eight ships are going to have to hold off 23. What's Nelson's hope? Yeah, you win quickly where you have the advantage and then come back and help your remaining eight ships. So originally, if you do this law of squares and you calculate what was the you know, Franco-Spanish advantage, uh, 46 squared gives you 2116, 40 squared gives you 1600. The balance in favor of the enemy, okay, you can tell which side Lancaster's writing on, was 516. Looking at how Nelson did it, 32 versus 23 and 8 versus 23, he gets 1088 points to 1058. Balance in favor of the British is now plus 30. So going from down 516 to plus 30. Okay? This is a wonderful application of mathematics. I've listed a couple of homework problems if you want to try your hand at problems along this to see you know, how well this lecture is sinking in. A natural problem is what is the best way for Nelson to divide his forces? You know, if we assume this law of squares, how should he have divided his forces? How close was he? Anybody have any thoughts as to what the final score was in the battle? How many ships did the British lose? Any thoughts? Any thoughts on the, how many the French and Spanish war, lost? Remember, they are French. All of them. The French weren't quite that bad. So the Franco-Spanish fleets lost 22 ships without a single British vessel being lost. So what you forgot is some of the ships were able to flee and retreat. But you have to take that into account when you're considering you know, the Franco armies okay, and navies. You know. Sometimes they just leave you know, before you're able to finish the battle.
I, this is an ex yes. A lot of it comes down to the strategies, um, how you're able to bear in line. So for instance, what you want to do is you want to cross the T. If you have the enemy ship in a column and you have yours perpendicular to it, you can train all your guns on them. So there's a lot of things you can do to magnify your effectiveness. This assumption that it's this constant rate is absurd. The other thing is the British were better sailors. And the question is, do you have slightly better ships? So there's a lot of things going on. Uh, you, my, my kids, when they were looking at a practice version of this talk, said it would be wrong not to at least show you a picture of Lord Nelson and the monument in uh, England to him, Trafalgar Square. Unfortunately, Lord Nelson was killed uh, in the battle, but is considered by many to be you know, the greatest British uh, naval uh, leader of all time. All right. How many of you have heard the expression, you know, England expects that every man will do his duty? One of the most famous war messages of all time. And so back then, the way they sent messages from ships was they used flags. The original message was actually England confides, England is confident that every man will do his duty. When you look at this text, which word is the worst word to send? Duty. You have to spell out, uh-oh, uh, this is not good. Some other okay, so there are some things where um, you have to spell out words that don't exist in the language of the flag symbols. And so when Nelson was giving the message, one of his aides said, well, if you want me to use the word confides, I have to spell that out. It's going to take more time to tell all the ships. Can we use the word expects, please? Sure. Not a big deal. But it's very interesting to think back as to you know, what goes on, what kind of messages can you transmit? And in the, you know, in a battle, the ability to send messages quickly, this goes back to your question of you know, what are the advantages. Mathematics of communication, which words do you have predefined signals for? This is extremely important. So one of the things I'm huge on is applications of math wherever possible. Okay, so in terms of the battles, you know, the British were 0 for 27, 1,666 dead or wounded, the Franco-Spanish 22 of 33 lost, 13,781 captured dead or wounded. Okay, so the biggest issue is that this is a completely deterministic model. This is absurd to have a completely deterministic model. So for those of us in 341, later in the semester, what we want to do is we want to look at probabilistic models, where we replace these coefficients with random variables that draw different values. Now instead of just being able to write down a closed form solution, we're going to have to do some kind of integration. And we're going to be integrating potentially over a matrix with variable coefficients you know, that are drawn. This leads to stochastic processes. This is extremely advanced. This is cutting edge stuff. A lot of this goes on in finance, economics, physics right now. And so we probably won't get too much into the nuts and bolts of this, but I want you to get a sense of where everything goes and how it all pieces together. The goal at the end of the day is to have a real world model to describe whatever you're interested in. You start off with something very simple and then you start adding as many bells and whistles as you can and you still have something that's mathematically tractable. In general, we cannot solve things like this in closed form. We have to resort to numerical simulation. And when you resort to numerical simulation, you want some idea of how much can I trust the results. So there's a whole method called this Monte Carlo methods. Anybody know why these are called Monte Carlo? It's random. Why would we use the phrase Monte Carlo? Uh, like, like random, gambling. random gambling. It's coming from gambling. Huge amount of probability is owed to people playing games. And so you have these probabilistic techniques, and you want to figure out how much can you trust the results. OK, I want to now go back and talk a little bit about Zeckendorf decompositions. So this is a discrete problem, but we're going to use some of the stuff we've been talking about continuous to handle this. And this is going to introduce us to a lot of the different probability tools that we'll be using in the rest of the semester. All right, so the Fibonacci numbers, we have the recurrence relation, Fn plus 1 is Fn plus Fn minus 1. The first few, hopefully you've all seen, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, and so on. So there's a beautiful theorem, Zeckendorf's theorem. Every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. Any computer science majors here? All right, the simplest proof of this, and I'll show you a more complicated proof later, is called the greedy algorithm proof. I'm going to demonstrate the greedy algorithm proof. Take a number like 51. Okay, it's not entirely random because I have prepared the tech code. 
The way the proof works is look at the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to your number. This is where the greedy comes into play. Take the largest number you can. What's the largest one I can take? So I, I put in 34, and then I look at the remainder, which is 17. So it's F8, the eighth Fibonacci number, plus 17. Now I look at 17. What's the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 17? 13. So I now put that in. Um, and now my remainder is 4. If I could have put in the number adjacent to 34, 21, I would have had two adjacent Fibonacci numbers in my decomposition. Whenever I have two adjacent Fibonacci numbers, their sum is also a Fibonacci number. And that would have violated that 34 is the largest Fibonacci number I could subtract. So if I could have subtracted 21 after 34, I could have subtracted their sum. So this proves when I do the greedy algorithm, I'm never going to have two numbers that are adjacent. And you just keep going down, and we end up getting um, all the way down to F1. OK? So this proves the decomposition exists. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to go ahead and prove that the decomposition is unique. If I shift all of the indices up by 1, I'll get a new decomposition. I'll get 83. It's going to be 55 plus 21 plus 5 plus 2, F9 plus F7 plus F4 plus F2. 51 miles is 82.1 kilometers, approximately. Anybody have any idea why these are so close to each other? The golden ratio. The golden ratio. Yes, why? You, well, uh, why, why is the, go the golden ratio is the correct answer. The golden ratio is the correct answer. Why is the golden ratio the correct answer for why these are so close? Good. So in the limit, each Fibonacci number is approximately the golden ratio larger than the previous. What's the golden ratio? 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, which is about 1.618. The conversion factor between miles and kilometers, 1.609. To tie into earlier the talk, where did kilometers come from? Where do we get kilometers from? Right, where do we get meters from? Where did we get that from? The French, the French Revolution, going back to the Napoleonic days. Okay, French Revolution gave us, you know, they defined one mile to be 1.609 approximate kilometers. This is just a coincidence that the golden mean, or at least I believe it's just a coincidence, happens to be so close to the conversion factor. But if you want the longest possible way to convert from kilometers to miles, if you don't feel like multiplying by 1.609, you can calculate the Zeckendorf expansion Increase all your indices by 1 and sum. And if you want to convert from kilometers to miles, you just go the other direction. <coughs> OK. So central limit theorem. As n goes to infinity, it turns out that the number of summons in Zeckendorf decompositions becomes normally distributed. So one of the most basic questions you can ask about something is, how many do I have? Well, if I choose specific numbers, I'm going to have, I could choose a number that's just a, the sum of two Fibonacci numbers. So I'm going to look at all numbers between the 2010th and 2011th Fibonacci number. This way, they'll all be roughly of the same size. They'll have the same candidate pool for the Zeckendorf decomposition. If I choose as my number F2010 plus F1000, that only has two summons. What this result is saying is that if you vary over all possible numbers in this interval, and for each number, you write down how many summons it has, and you plot it, you see a bell curve, you see a normal, you see a Gaussian. This is an incredible universality. And in fact, the reason that this is going on is the Gaussian is universal for so many different systems of behavior. When we're trying to figure out what goes on, it almost doesn't matter what we look at, we see the normal distribution coming into play. Now, this is a completely deterministic process. For each number, there's nothing random going on. I just calculate how many sums it has. But when I look at the plot, it looks to be normally distributed. All right. So we, uh, did, did we talk at all about the Fibonaccis and this alternate definition of them last time? I, I, I just want to say this because um, this is fun and you know, I like to sometimes discuss what my research is. There's another way of defining the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers are the only sequence such that every number can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent terms. I'm not going to go through the whole proof why, I'm just going to do a little bit. Start with the number 1. So I'm not allowed to use two terms next to each other. I have to add the number 2. Do I have to add the number 3, or can I write 3 as a sum of non-adjacent terms? Do I have to add 3, yes or no? 
Yeah, I can't use 2 plus 1, they're adjacent. So I have to add 3. What about 4? Can I write 4 in terms of what I have without using it? Yes, 4 is 3 plus 1. What about 5? Nope, I'm not allowed to use a number twice. I can use each number at most once. I can't use adjacent. I have to add 5. Can I add 6? Or can I get 6? Yeah, I can get 6 with 5 plus 1. What about 7? 5 plus 2. So the next one I have to add is 8, then 13. It turns out this is an equivalent definition of the Fibonacci numbers. They're the unique sequence that has this property. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So it turns out the whole key to the analysis is the recurrence relation. You can view this as saying we have bins of size 1. I can only use one element in each bin. I can't use any neighbors. So something that some of my students will be looking at this summer is, well, what happens if I have other rules of decomposition? What kind of sequences do these generate? Uh, let me give you some flavor, some of the other results we already have, and you see some of the universality. So it turns out that if I look at any recurrence relation, if all the coefficients are non-negative, it turns out you have very similar behavior. You have Gaussian behavior for the number of summons. Uh, you have a Zeckendorf decomposition. Let me give you a rough idea of why we have this normal behavior. Let's take the simplest case. Let's take base 10 expansions. So base 10 is just the recurrence relation. Hn plus 1 is 10 times Hn. And now my notion of illegal decomposition, instead of saying I can't have two things next to each other, is now each coefficient is between 0 and 9, except for the leading number. What, is, what must be true about my leading digit? When you look at a number, what, what's true about the leading digit? It's not between 0 and 9, it's between 1 and 9. And so now for every number between hn and hn plus 1, the first term is going to be, say, a n times h n. a n is between 1 and 9. All the other terms are between 0 and 9. I have a sum of independent random variables. We talked about this last time. Sums of independent random variables tends to become normally distributed. So when you go through, you end up getting the central limit theorem. So this is why if you just count, you take any large number and you count how many numbers do you have, if you sum the digits, that will become normally distributed as you go further and further down. This should hopefully give you some idea of why we get this behavior for the Fibonacci's. Um, I'm not going to talk about gaps in the interest of time, but I'll leave some slides here. I'm not going to talk about spacing between gaps. I want to end with the cookie problem. So for the people in my class, this is chapter 6. This is one of my favorite problems in mathematics. It's also called the stars and bars, but it's not nearly as much fun to me when you say stars and bars. All right, so the idea is I want to have C cookies. I want to divide the cookies among P distinct people such that all the cookies are divided. I am not assuming that all, everybody gets an equal number of cookies. I'm not even assuming everybody gets a cookie. Okay? It turns out that the number of ways to do this is C plus P minus 1 choose P minus 1. It's just a binomial coefficient. In the additional comments on my webpage for today, uh, I did not do this. I didn't have the patience, but this is on a math riddles page I maintain. Somebody went through all the different ways to divide 10 cookies among five people, starting with 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, going all the way down and listed every single possibility. It took them a long time to list all those possibilities. I want to show you a faster way to get this using combinatorics. And so the whole idea of combinatorics can basically be boiled down to the following sentence. Tell a story where you calculate something two different ways. One way is the way you want and hard. One way is equivalent and easy. So imagine we have C plus P minus 1 cookies in a line. And I'll explain in a minute why we're adding P minus 1 cookies. We take the original cookie monster. All right, how many of you have seen what they've done to Cookie Monster on Sesame Street? According to Cookie Monster, cookies are now a, what kind of food? A sometimes food. All right, this is the original classic Cookie Monster who is always up for eating cookies. All right, the difficulty is controlling him and telling him you will only eat P minus 1 cookies. All right, uh, I will also include a link to the episode where Cookie Monster meets the count and a pile of cookies. And they have to decide between Cookie Monster eating them and the count counting them. And what kind of you know, compromise they work out. You should be able to figure that one out. So imagine Cookie Monster eats P minus 1 cookies from C plus P minus 1. How many ways can he do this? By definition, it's C plus P minus 1 choose P minus 1. I have C plus P minus 1 objects. He eats P minus 1 of them. When he eats P minus 1 of them, he's put in P minus 1 partitions. And he's divided the object into P sets. If he eats one cookie, 
he has two sets, everything up to the first cookie and everything past. If he eats two cookies, everything up to the first eaten cookie, everything from the first to the second, everything from the second onward. So let's take as an example eight cookies and five people. There wasn't enough room to do ten cookies. Cookie Monster shows up. Cookie Monster gobbles four cookies. And you see the first person gets two cookies. The second person, not their lucky day, they get zero. <coughs> Third person gets two. Fourth person gets three. Fifth person gets one. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of ways Cookie Monster can eat uh, four cookies from 13 as there are to divide eight cookies among five people. And that's the proof. That's the story proof of what's going on. And so it turns out you can generalize this greatly. You might feel that it is not fair that people could end up with zero cookies. So you might have a requirement, maybe everybody gets at least one cookie. Or maybe some people are science students and they should get more cookies than humanity students. Or maybe you know, some people are younger and they cry more and you want to make sure that they get at least two cookies. You, know, you can put in different constraints. So if you assume that person I gets at least CI cookies, what you do is you let YI be the number of cookies you get above that guaranteed minimum. And then it turns out that you have an equivalent problem of now just counting Y1 plus YP is C minus the number of cookies that have to be assigned. And so you can solve problems like this. I'm not going to go through all the details here. You don't want to do too much algebra in public. But essentially, you can now use this to prove the Zeckendorf theorem. Is what you're doing is, if I have uh, a number between fn and fn plus 1, it turns out I have to have fn as one of my summons. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a partition. So this is something we've talked a little bit about in probability in 341. I want to split my numbers, not by where they lie on the real line, but by their properties. And so this is a great theme in mathematics. You want to break your problem up into cases, cases where things are easier. I want to break it into the case of having exactly k summons. What does it mean to have k summons? Well, it means I have k summons chosen, maybe fi1, fi2, fi3. And I'm going to have gaps. I'm going to have the gap up to the first summoned. Then I'm going to have the gap from the first summon to the second summon, the second summon to the third summon, and so on. I'm not allowed to choose adjacent Fibonacci numbers, so all the gaps have to be at least two, except for the first one, which has to be at least one. So when you do a little bit of algebra, it turns out that this is equivalent to the cookie problem. And when you do the math, at the end of the day, the number of ways to have exactly k summons is this binomial coefficient. So the following is then a proof of the Gaussian behavior, that we have this explicit formula and all we need to do is use Stirling's formula that says n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n squared of 2 pi n. This is because the binomial coefficient n choose k is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. So all we have to do is we have to use Stirling's formula and some algebra. One of the best ways to prove Stirling's formula is this continuous to discrete that we've been talking about. Sometimes it's useful to model something continuous with discrete. Sometimes it's useful to model something that's discrete with something that's continuous. This function, whenever you take s to be a positive integer, is actually a factorial. If I take s to be n plus 1, uh, this is just n factorial. And the proof is integration by parts and induction. And now we can use methods of real analysis and complex analysis to estimate n factorial very nicely. And so I had a bunch of small students. And I had them go through the analysis using factorials, and 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 using factorials. And eventually, in the end, they got to a Gaussian. The whole point is once you got to the idea of using factorials, it became algebra. Not necessarily easy algebra, but this is why I run a small group. And you know, they can play with it. All right. So over here, I just have the code as to how you would investigate stuff like this if anybody is interested in seeing uh, how you would do stuff like this. And here's a different run. So just in summary, we've seen difference in differential equations do a really good job of modeling the world. There's a huge interplay between deterministic, which is easy and fun to deal with, and stochastic, which is much harder but more accurate. And so this is where the probability really comes into play, is having processes that are not deterministic that depend on events. Uh, the prevalence of the central limit theorem. In so many things you're going to be looking at, the central limit theorem will be emerging. Approximating continuous with discrete or converting discrete to continuous. This goes on all the time. And then 
um, as a bonus, you know, here are some homework problems if you want. I've listed you know, a couple of ones as just practice problems. For those of you who want more math and warfare, I've got some stuff on the Battle of Midway. Okay. Have a great day.